Okay, that's way fancier than what we have. Um, I'll, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I did in the past years with some of my students, which is um, Williston Basin. We started out like everybody would if he wants to have get money from the oil companies with a middle bucket, and then would move on to the shales. Because the first thing you see, if you look at the shale, it looks like this. And some of you may remember these televisions from the 60s when they go out. Yeah, That's more or less how it looks like. So it's kind of disappointing at the, at the beginning. So anyway. So, oops, that was the wrong one. The button I shouldn't push. So I'll escape. Thank you. See, I'm not more. Yeah, yeah, and I intuitively pushed the wrong button. So anyway, thank you. So um, the motivation of this is, of course, it looks all nice and dandy, but the real motivation is I went in, looked which formation would give me money for getting a graduate student fund, and that's what I went for. But of course, the motivation for that is that the Bakken is one of the most important onshore US reservoirs. You can see I highlighted the part that we mostly worked on, which is North Dakota. But essentially speaking, what, what we're doing also holds true for a, for a larger part of Montana. If you believe the USGS estimates, which are 2008, and then something came came up recently, and then we're talking about something in the order of 3.65 billion barrels of undiscovered oil left. So there's a lot of oil to go for. Most of this stuff, so in the bucket alone, yeah? so um, there's a lot to, lot to go for, and a lot of especially smaller to mid-sized companies go for this type of oil. I mean, there's, there's more oil in, in, in the Wilson Basin and the Madison and all the other Devonian units. And, down to the dead wood yeah, and, and all kinds of stuff. So what does the bucket look like? The bucket, luckily for those who measure cores, is relatively thin. It is Devonian and Strelzy, Devonian Mississippian boundary. Yeah? And you have this middle bucket dolomite, which is not a dolomite. We can talk about this a little bit. And that is, is sandwiched between these two shale units. The lower bucket is a little bit thicker. The upper bucket shale is a little bit thinner. So the, what is kind of outlined here in red, the middle Bakken unit, which is mostly a mixed carbonate siliciclastic rock with dolomite cement, that is where the dolomite came from. And if you go to the core center in, in um, Denver, you can actually see that generations of geologists poured acid over the cores. So what now happens is all the carbonate particles have gone down because of the acid, all the dolomite cement stand up. Yeah. So what you'll see is mostly the dolomite cement. Yeah. Geologists fault. Anyway, um, so so this is the main re reservoir here. Yeah. In the shales, this is where the oil was generated. These are the source rocks. Uh, interestingly, the companies mostly focus on the middle bucket yeah, because that is where they get the oil out, and they have never really looked at the shales. Well, so I'll introduce a little bit to the shale today, but I'll start with the middle bucket and then I'll go on to the upper bucket. I'm not allowed to talk about the lower bucket because otherwise Marathon will kill me and I really don't want to do, get into that problem. Anyway, so if you look at it, fancy se sedimentologists always sequence stratigraphy, essentially speaking, it's putting a timeline or several timelines through the succession. It's, it's a more nomenclature than anything else, yeah? but it sounds good. Yeah. So that's what I mean. So there are previous sequence stratigraphic models for the back. Yeah. Smith and Boston did one, kind of on the quick, if you read that. Yeah. And then Angelo, Angelo, uh, Angelo and Boitois did one, and that was more based on um, Igno fossil. But if you look at that, it has no fine scale sequence stratigraphy. So there are, no, there are some systems tracked, but there are no power sequences. I'll, I'll explain to you a little bit what that is. It actually, as I said, it's a nomenclature. Yeah. It's not that difficult. But there are small-scale cycles that can be interpreted as power sequences in the middle back in them, and that's what we actually try to figure out and try to correlate through the basin. And so the goal of this study is define and identify these cycles or power sequences for the middle back. This is something I sometimes show in my, in my classes, yeah? and the educational part of this is the following. Yeah? If you look at stratigraphy in general, yeah, what they do is, they think that a unit has a certain characteristic and goes on forever. This is called, based on these guys here, yeah, layer cake stratigraphy. Because look at that, yeah, all the layers 
look, essentially speaking, or should, depending on who baked it, yeah, essentially speaking, similar throughout each of these layers. Yeah. And my message is, this does not exist in natural systems. Yeah. So with other words, is, is stratigraphic subdivision, as is here, can only be wrong. That was my, essentially speaking, the way I went into the bargain. So why? The example that is always taken for anoxic basins, which is in part not anoxic, but that is a different matter, is the Black Sea. And the Black Sea is this deep. The, where's Istanbul here? The, the Bosporus yeah, that, that leads into the Black Sea is actually not that deep. So you essentially speaking go over hump, yeah? then you go back into this deep basin. So essentially the bas basin is stratified. The lower part, that's the reason why it's anoxic. The lower part doesn't move at all. So it's in part an anoxic basin, the deeper part. But if you look where all the Romanians and um, Bulgarians go for their vacations, yeah, because they can't afford anything else, it's nice actually there, they don't go to the shores of a freaking anoxic basin yeah, because it wouldn't be nice. They go to the shores, look how nice that is, nice beaches everything. And that's the reason why they go to the Black Sea. Yeah? So if we take that to the Bakken system or to any other system, what does this tell us? It tells us that any basin, yeah, regardless how the deeper part looks, yeah, has a shallow part that is characterized by a beach. So somewhere here. Yeah? Then the further you go down at something like 500 meters out, what do you find? You find, find finer grain sizes. So, so it looks something like this, so more silt, finer sand, you're not as coarse and not continuous sand as you at the beach. And if you go way, way out, you know, five kilometers or so, what you'll find is very fine-grained material, mostly um, shales or stuff like that. We can talk about shale. This is actually one of my favorite topic. You, you know the word oil shale, yeah? The nice thing is it's not a shale and it doesn't contain oil. Yeah? Talking about a misnamer, yeah? that's great. Anyway, so this stuff, may be anoxic, but in most of the times it's actually not. Yeah? In the case of the Black Sea it is, but in other cases it's not. So if we apply this to the Bakken system, we will do, and this is schematic, you know, all of you know about biostatigraphy, should know, or better know that this is schematic, but this would know, what would mean that part of the middle member is most likely equivalent to parts of the lower shale, yeah? And part of the upper shale is most likely time equivalent to something either in the lodge pole or that has been eroded out of the basin. It is by logic. There's no, no big science or so behind. So what we try to do is we try to incorporate the black shales, at least in part, as part of this system, of the middle bucket system, as the deep end of this very low inclined mixed carbonate silicic plastic ramp that it is. So what do we do? Um, that was my first graduate student here in the US. And he had, he had the pleasure to measure 40 cores in beautiful Grand Forks, North Dakota yeah? um, in February, actually. <laughs> She's hardcore, he worked for Oxy, now it's OK. So now we measured about 70 cores, so we have a pretty good idea um, what's going on. We came up with something like 11 facies mm, that are here aligned along what we would call an energy index. You can see it overall works. We'll, we'll talk about this low energy thing on top there. But So it starts with the black shale. So this is the lowest energy. This is a wacky stone. That's why it's sticking out here. And then the further you go up, the more you get silt and sand. And here, these are actually sandstones and in part always. So we have 11 facies. I will, won't go through these in details because otherwise I put everybody to sleep here. Mm. And this is, this is the distribution of the course, which is, of course, driven by what the oil companies thought was interesting at the time. So we'll go through this along a transect that goes from the inner part of the, of the basin, so from the deepest part to the shallowest here. So these shelf mudstones is something, essentially um, speaking, what, is, what characterizes the lower and the, and the upper back. And so it is actually very diverse. If you look at it in core, it, seems to be really monotonous because of black. Yeah? So you need some thin sections. We'll talk about this ultra thin thin sections to actually see something. What you can see if you look at the at the hand samples, okay you can see a black it is yeah? do you see these cracks, these deformed cracks. So something cracked very early on and then 
got compacted. And who cares? Well, actually, the Orkham here should care, but think about it. What cracked once will crack again. That's what it, the fracking is all about. Yeah? So the more you have of this kind of stuff, the better it is for fracking. So these, these rocks are in part laminate, in part massive. Yeah? But deposition, and we'll get back to that, and probably in part by suspension, in part in bad load because there's some ripples in it. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. Then typical offshore faces. You know, offshore, this is where the bugs have enough time to dig through the sediment, yeah, and that's what you'll see. So you get a bunch of bioturbate faces in there. Yeah. So part of that are these mud to wacky stones, so more carbonates, mostly actually associated with these with these shales. So probably the deepest end of this, and then these nereitis siltstone because this this trace fossil is called Nereitis misuriensis. Yeah, not that I would recognize it, but people who actually know this stuff have done that for me. Yeah. And what you can see is a, a bunch of clay-filled stuff in an overall homogenized siltstone. And definitely a little bit shallower than this, this wacky stone. And then you get distinct storm beds in which, in this case, have been completely bioturbated. There are remnants of that in there. But when the storm beds get thicker, the more proximal you get, actually get them preserved. And um, you can more or less see it, or you probably have to believe me, but it's kind of gray on gray. But if you can see that, you can see kind of the mudstone, similar to these here, the bioturbated. Here you get into a sandstone, here you get back into mudstone. Can you more or less see that? See, if you work on the middle button all day, yeah, it's gray after gray after gray, so you get really depressed. You want something nicer. The three fox is actually great. It's red and green. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you can see an overall energy grading that goes from these shales to more and more sand, thicker and thicker storm laminae that characterize the offshore. If you go into the foreshore, so the beach to kind of the environment where the waves come in, yeah, the shore face environment, this is this is the type of faces um, you'll get. These four faces will go through these one after one. So in the lower part of the shore face environment, so essentially speaking, to give you an idea where maybe depending how tall you are, your feet feet will just touch still touch the ground when you walk into the water, yeah, where it gets kind of silty. So you have a bunch of ripples here, yeah, which is they can be isolated ripples or sometimes ripples that actually are stacked on top of each other. But it's all kind of sand to maybe siltstone. Yeah. In, in this part of the so we're somewhere here. Maybe you're swimming over it. I just realized that I would probably be swimming over it. So if you're taller than me, you probably can still touch the ground. Um, and then if you go into the shallower part, you get into these cross bedding. Yeah, so the ripples actually kind of grade into more into higher dunes, you get into these cross bedded faces, something like this here, you know, that can be made of olites or of uh, sandstones. And we can actually discuss why part of this is silt and other part here is sandy that forms the dunes. And if you get into the beach environment, it's actually nicely planar laminated, typically like beaches. If you have ever thought about that, you lay down on a beach, yeah? you don't lay down on anything that's rippled, so it's actually nice and flat, slightly inclined towards the sea. And if you actually would dig into it, if you have kids, you do that, right? to build sand castles, yeah, you will see that it's actually nice and plain laminate, just like these guys. And then the transition zone on the other end of things yeah, that goes, essentially speaking, from this foreshore, shore face environment to the offshore that contains some mud laminates you can see in sand in between. It's also bioturbated because the critters there have actually time to bioturbate yeah, and it gets preserved. Whereas if you go into this environment here, the waves are constantly moving yeah, and even though the, the guys are burrowing, it's not preserved because it's constantly redeposited. Okay, and then finally, on the very proximal end, so associated with these oids, we get something that we interpreted as lagoon and typical lagoonal deposits are kind of muddy, silty like this. Yeah, so not much organic matter left. That doesn't have to be it, but in this case it is. And in some places you get actually these beautiful algal mounds. Yeah, this is from a horizontal core. Yeah. So you can actually see the mound structure, these algal mats growing. And in this case, they're associated with, with oids, but also below that you have these type of, of um, mudstones and, and um, siltstones that don't contain a lot of organic matter. Okay, back to what are we going to do with this? Or why is this important? Who cares is more or less the question. Yeah? 
So why all these pages? 11 pages is kind of a lot. That's what JSR told me when we submitted the, the shale paper. It was, what, you have 11 pages? Yeah. And people, after reading pages number six, won't remember what number one is. Yeah. Where well, they kind of have a point, yeah. so we, we condense it a little bit. But um, nevertheless, and I try to condense it a little bit for you here too. So what does it give us? It does give us a base yeah, to reconstruct these lateral phases changes just based on energy. Yeah? So energy is going from here down, energy level, until we reach the shares. In sementology, that's called Walter's Law. Let's go there for now. Then the energy grading here gives us an indication of how deep the water was at the time this specific phases was deposited. Yeah? Relative, not absolute, but relative. Deepest water depth, shallowest water depth, so nearly exposed, yeah, beaches, so as you know. That. It's the basis for sequence stratigraphic approach because what we will be doing is we will be looking at the succession of facies in a little bit, yeah, and then we will see that each of these cycles yeah, will have this type of facies, vertical facies succession, and that is a base for interpreting something in sequence stratigraphic measure. And as it I don't know why I put the disclaimer, but essentially speaking, the disclaimer is this is idealized, meaning you will never find this complete facial succession in the field. You will find pieces of it. Yeah? So this, uh, this on top of this, and this is probably missing, part of this is missing this, and then this may or may not be developed, depending on which cycle you have. Yeah? That is a disclaimer. So not that you afterwards tell me, but first you wanted to sell me this complete cycle, and then you couldn't even show it. Yeah, it was not. Not convincing. Okay. Not the best figure, but it, it shows you some of the, the the general concepts here. So there are two general trends which had been discovered before Smith and Buston did and Le Fever published it five times. I don't don't know what, what else. But in general you can see actually that you have the lower energy facies at the bottom here, okay, including the shales here. Then you go up, yeah, and the further you go up, the more you get into the high energy phases here, the sandstones and the oids. And then at some point, about two thirds to three quarters through the succession, yeah, you actually start to get into lower energy phases again. So essentially speaking, you have a coarsening and then, can, uh, then a fining upward in the middle bucket on top. Now we get a little bit into sequence right? It's actually really easy. The, the, what they are doing here is they try to relate which type of phases you get what the sedimentary system does to a sea level curve. Yeah? So you get you have a sea level curve where sea level is going up. That's what up to a maximum point. That's what they call the high stand. In this particular version of those of you who love the Exxon way, go with the Exxon way. There's not real. The, the thinking behind is exactly the same. Yeah? It's just co loved four system tracks. Exxon loves three. Still loves three. Yeah? So. And you can see actually, and the Americans love acronyms. Yeah? Beautiful. Yeah? HST, beautiful acronym. Yeah? High stand systems track. Yeah? And then they ran out of the three letter acronyms and, and used the four ones. Yeah? Falling stage systems track. But it's, it's all, essentially speaking, relatively easy. Yeah? And it all describes the same. So we go, sea level goes up to a high point, which they define as a sequence boundary. Then sea level falls yeah? up to this point. Which interestingly, in this field, we have four systems tracked and only three delimiting surfaces. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, and then we, at the very low stand point, which I defined as maximum regression, yeah, we go into a so called low stand where sea level slowly um, increases again and then into a transgressive system track that here is called, is, is abbreviated with TSD. So, this is essentially speaking the subdivisions. We, we can see that we go to a from a falling system tract here, get a maximum regression into a low stand of the whole system, and then we start a transgression again at the very top yeah, where, the, where the shales accumulate. So we have a part of this curve, essentially speaking, mostly the falling system tract and the low stand system tract here, um, characterized by the middle bucket. Okay, but we wanted to go for power sequences so for smaller units. Yeah? Though the middle bucket as you can see now, showing you a little bit, shows a bunch of these shallowing upward, smaller scale units. 
which also coarsening output, which we call parasynchronous. So something that looks more or less like this. You can start with a shale, doesn't have to be. What that is, you stand at a specific point, and the system is slowly prograding over that. And while it's prograding, it keeps shedding coarser and coarser material to the specific point where you're standing. So an idealized succession should look more or less like this. And if you look at the beautiful bucken, yeah, this is how it looks like. So sometimes they're really poorly exposed, but in places you can see that actually nicely. So you start with the wacky stones here, you go into these narrator stations, and here you get the OLEDs in. Yeah? So overall you have a distinct coarsening. Won't do it in, in every section, but overall we have a maximum of four or three power sequences at the margin and a maximum of about six in the basin centers. We have actually a difference in the amount of these power sequences within the middle bucket. And what do you do? Why, why do we care about sequence stratigraphy? We care about it because each of these units here yeah, that are individual power sequences, the tops or bottoms, represent timelines that we can trace through the basin. So instead of lithocorrelation, yeah, my students are not allowed to do lithocorrelation. Lithocorrelation means you correlate a sandstone with a sandstone with a sandstone. Yeah? Not good. If you go to the beach, which from here is probably equally far to both sides. Yeah? If you go to a beach in, let's say, the East Coast, yeah? and what, what does correlation or should correlation do? Correlation should um, connect time equivalent strata. Yeah? So you should connect a sand with a silt with a mud. Now that's something that normally doesn't happen. So you're starting to cheat. Yeah? The way to cheat is you use differences in sea level, yeah? and the moment sea level goes down, it will be noted in all of the units, and you use this particular line, timeline, when sea level's at its lowest place and goes back up to actually connect these different phases. That is a trick. Yeah? So this is what, what I did here, and this is what all these sequence stratigraphic um, gigs do all the time. Yeah? So we are putting timelines into the succession. What you can also see, and this is the overall trend here, you can see that the whole system started to prograde. Yeah? You can see the oolitic shoals, which are more or less beach deposits here at the, at the very margin. Yeah, so we're somewhere here. And then these things actually prograde in. Yeah? And during the next power sequence, they prograde in even further. Yeah? Then they stay a little bit here, and then they go away. They prograde out. So with other words, what kind of succession do we have? We have a succession where these sand bodies of the beach actually goes into the basin for a while, stays there, and then moves back out, which is what you would expect from any system to do. Yeah? It's not something very specific to the buck. Yeah? Or to do a nice sketch, I copied that out of the textbook, yeah? so you can actually, essentially speaking, let's take this one for now, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah? So your system actually progresses in, so it goes into the into the basin, and then goes back out. And now the question, who cares about this? The question is, are these things like here, these sand bodies connected everywhere, or are they disconnected? Yeah? So if these oolites and these sands represent oil-bearing strata, especially oil-bearing strata, if we have a situation like this here, it doesn't care. You can do lethal stratigraphy, even you do, you're doing it wrong. Yeah? You're violating timelines here. But it doesn't matter because you drill into one of these and you're good, yeah? because you will suck the oil out of all of them. But if you have this situation, yeah, you have a problem. Because if you drill into this here, it will not get the oil out of all of them. And look, yeah, this body here is disconnected from this body. This, these two are connected, so it seems like at the very margin we have a situation like this, but here we definitely have a situation like this, which means if we want to drill into this type of lithology, we have to plan well. And just, I think I'm not allowed to tell you that, so you haven't heard that, but this type of lithology is the reservoir in Canada. And in most of the US, it's fairly useless, which is probably fair to say. So it doesn't really matter. Okay, I'll leave you with that, and the middle bucket will go to the upper bucket shale. <coughs> so we move up to this green <coughs> unit that is on top of the middle buck. A little bit about the methods. It's actually nice mm, how the projector does that. The first thing you need if you want to do a shale study are ultra-thin thin sections. Normal thin sections here in the US are 30 micrometers thick. If you want to see anything in shale, 
Mm? You need to make them thinner. So this is 30 micrometers. What do you see? Nothing. Mm? This is about 20 micrometers. There's one company in the US that can do that. Mm? Because what you have to do is, before you do the last switch, mm, you have to stop. Mm? You have to see that, be very careful that you don't take the last little bit of the thin section off. Mm? So one company is, has enough time or is careful enough or whatever uh, to do this. And then you can get these kind of things. So all the thin sections that you show this have a margin where they actually took the last bit off. So anyway, and then you can see all kinds of funky things. See that the, the so-called silt, I mean, are actually not that straight. Yeah? And there are all kinds of funky things in here, conodons, for example, yeah? and all, all other kinds of stuff. So that's one thing you have to do if you want to do a shale study. The second thing is you will use an SEM. Yeah, so scanning electron microscope. And the best is if, it, if you have it with a backscattered electron detector. And, and what this gives you is something, some images like this. And you can see that there are different compositions here. So, so the, the pyrite, these are pyrite pieces here, they will light up. And the organic matter is mostly are these black dots that are all over the place. So it actually shows you how the organic matter looks like where it is located. It also shows you where the pyrite is. It also shows you, for example, that in this, this is the burrow here, yeah? as you can see here. You can even see it here. All the black stuff is the organic matter. There's nearly no organic matter in here. So that means whatever was burrowing there was eating the organic matter and was leaving behind the stuff that had no organic matter. OK. So what did we do? We went and looked at the core ignorant as we were several years ago. And first tried to measure, measure in, in a section, generalized section based on core and didn't see anything. So what we did then is we took continuous thin sections. I, could, I did that or we did that because the USGS paid. Yeah, that was nice. So we took, this is the, the core, the piece of the core that, that the USGS gave us. Yeah? So we took a continuous thin section over these nearly two feet, this nearly two feet a foot interval here. Yeah. So all of these observations based on things that you can see how variable the phase is. And then we went back into the core and actually looked at the core, knowing what we were looking at. And then you can start seeing all kinds of things. So radiolarian deposits here, lac deposits here that are sticking out further and so on and so forth. Shells in part of the succession. Certain laminations yeah, and stuff like that. So the documentation was very detailed. And we did that at a total for this particular study, actually for three cores. And then some of my grad students, if you don't want to do anything by yourself, always employ some graduate students. They can do the work for another 33 for the lower back and 37 for the upper back. A um, lot of time in North Dakota. So these are the three cores we used because these three were actually at the USGS in Denver. And then these were the ones where we checked the concept with yeah, to get a bunch of thin sections to see whether we the observations we had from these three cores were right. So we did the documentation these two ways. We, we did a macroscopic and a microscopic observation and combined these with these three cores. And the effect is, of course, we have a complete thin section documentation of the history of sedimentation in these particular three cores. Now, I will introduce you to some bioturbations that in part have not been described before. So in the upper Bakken shale that holds true for part of the lower Bakken too, we have four types of burrows or traces. Two of them are horizontal and two with two types of fecal string that are, we call them multi-directional at the area. So they're, they're going all over the place. Yeah? And to show that, you have to do two types of thin section. You take the normal vertical ones, and then you take some horizontal. So can kind of parallel to bed. So these, these are for all funky names. So the horizontal ones are planolitis. You can see actually that the sedimentologist did this look at that. Planolitis type A, planolitis type B. Yeah. So a paleontologist would have called it planolitis, I don't know what, montanensis and planolitis coloradensis or something like this. Yeah. Sedimentologists have, have no time for this. Yeah, they just move on. So, or here, ISP means just igno species, forget it. Yeah. So it's phycosiphon, and then, and there you see, actually, this was done by, by a paleontologist, but he wasn't too sure. Can you see that? Insertum, yeah. So anyway, so we'll, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. It's actually, it's hard to see, but it's because it's black on black. So it's a little, the rough side. So anyway, we'll start with the planolitis. 
So the normal planetitis type A is actually a little bit smaller than the, than the type B, so it's in the range of, of 750 micrometers uh, long, yeah, much, much thinner than that because of compaction. Yeah? Compaction goes, was this way, was originally round, yeah, so compaction is a lot. But of course, it doesn't affect the lateral mm. component. You can see if you do actually the backscatter, you had this photo before, there's very little organic matter in there and a lot of organic matter associated often with pyrite. The outside, you can see, see that here still, yeah? So very little organic matter in the burrow and a lot around it. And then planolitis type B, same thing, but just much bigger. You can see several millimeters long here, yeah? sometimes filled with coarser material, relatively obvious. So these were not so, um, so hard to convince people to have these. And then there are two types of fecal strings. Difference between burrow and fecal string is burrow, you have whatever goes through there and makes a burrow. Yeah? And it's filled actively or passively with something. But this thing is actually open. If you look at these fecal strings, that just means, let's see whether I find a diplomatic way to say that, um, the animal goes through the sediment and leaves the excrements behind, but doesn't leave necessarily a tunnel yeah, or a burrow behind. So we're dealing here with excrements. Yeah, sorry, that wasn't my fault. So the black dots here, these, these phycosyphon, they, these type of phycosyphon, they're a little bigger. It's kind of hard to see, but so these things here. Yeah. And you can actually, they only occur together with, with all kinds of other components of conodons here and, and phosphate here, yeah? so, and a lot of quartz silt and carbonate silt. Yeah? If you actually look in the back scale, you can see that this phycosyphon, in contrast to the other one, accumulates a lot of pyrite and also still has a lot of organic matter. So these phycosyphon uh, type burrows actually do contain a lot of organic matter, which is the reason why they are so black. So now we get to the incertain things. This is actually really hard to see on the projector, but I'll do my best. What you can see though are the holes. Yeah? You may not be able to see much more, but see a beautiful silt bed here and here, and see the hole? There, 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 there. See them? All over the place. So if you deposit silt laminae, yeah, you don't deposit them with holes. Yeah? You deposit them nice and flat. The moment you have holes, something made the hole. Yeah? So in this case, whatever burrow went through there, made the hole and it should, I don't know why I put, put a black marker here on, on a black background, but um, it should have marked the holes in here. And so there's a bunch of, of burrows actually going through different parts of this unit and actually producing the holes. This is phycosyphon insert. So this was the horizontal part of the story. If you look at the, or the vertical, if you look at the horizontal, yeah, and you actually trace them out, this is more or less how it looks like, yeah, perpendicular to bedding. So you have a lot of these things. Yeah. This is parallel to bedding. You can kind of see that looking at the arrow. See this? So these are the fecal strings, the strings of this animal leaving the fecal stuff behind. Yeah. And again, you need ultra thin thin section, otherwise it will look like this, yeah. absolutely black. You won't see a thing. A little bit because people accuse me of, of um, making up stuff and saying these are water escape structures. A and I cheated a little bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain it. So, yeah, beautiful slide. If you actually look, you can see a few of the outlines, kind of a little bit. What is wrong about this? This is actually the, the part, if you, if you have a burrow like, that goes like this, it will compact it so much that it should be much more lenticular. This is the part where the burrow actually came up again. Yeah? So you, you have a, a cut through a piece where the burrow came up and then you compress it. This is the reason why it's still so roundish. But it, it's better to show this than to show something that's extremely flat because um, it's, it's just better to see. The next one, only look at the up, upper thing, but you can kind of see it like, like this. See that here? Yeah? So actually the burrow thing went up, went through this, and went back down. Yeah? So forget the lower, lower thing, it's not the same burrow, but this is essentially speaking how this works. If you have a water escape structure, water doesn't just come up yeah, and then think differently and goes back down, it just doesn't happen. The same thing here, yeah? see the U shape? So this is something that, something that was burrowing had to make because water doesn't do that. Yeah? Water doesn't produce a new shape or burrow-like structure. It 
it just doesn't happen unless you assume that gravity has changed, yeah? which most likely didn't happen. Yeah? So these are not waterscape structures. This is, if this is whatever the the fishies subdivision we we came with. So essentially speaking, these three things I'll go through these in in detail. So I'll, I'll introduce you. I'll go. And, and present a depositional model, go a little bit through the sequence stratigraphy, and I'll tell you a little bit about, about geochemistry data and why geochemistry data in part don't work. I don't want to argue against geochemistry, but you have to be careful. Keep in mind, data always tell you the truth. The stupid one is sitting in front of the picture. Yeah? We make the mistakes. We don't get it, is, the, is the more or less what, what I want to emphasize here. Okay. So the first thing we see, or we call facial association, one has a lot of radiolarians. So all these white dots here are radiolarians. In this case, they're mostly compacted, few preserved. Yeah? And in this case, with a lot of mud around it, they are well preserved. And the reason is mud compacts much, light, much easier than these radiolarians. Yeah? It's, it's easier to, to squish them when you only have radiolarians than if you have mud around it. Um, in places, now you need your fantasy, especially because it's the project, project yeah? So this is kind of the baseline here. You can kind of see that. See, see the silt lamina? It's kind of approaching the, the baseline, it's approaching, and then unfortunately the thin section ends. But you can imagine that if you have a ripple for set that goes like this, it's approaching, ba so it, it's kind of approaching a base, base level. Yeah? So actually these things have been reworked. Yeah? The mud probably came from the reworking. And it's at least in part now showing ripple structures. So there are ripple structures in part of these radiolarians. Yeah? And then you see phycosiphon everywhere. I mean, you can see that from, you see the hole here? Here's a hole, there's a hole. Yeah? Here, you can see how the silt is lining, the outer parts are actually going down. Yeah? So there's phycosiphon in certum in a lot of these, yeah? if not in nearly all. So the interpretation is that these radiolarian, pure radiolarites, as we call them, that nearly contain no mud may have been produced by suspension. Suspension just means yeah, you put a bunch of radiolarians into the water column, they die, and they fall down. Yeah? No reworking. The moment the reworking comes in, yeah, you get these more mud-rich components that have actually in part these ripples. These things have a bunch of bioturbations, which you can see by the holes. There are no bioturbations in this. So if anything is really anoxic, then these millimeter thick laminate this stuff, not. Most definitely not. OK, now in, in our facial association, too, so you have these, it, it all looks the same. Yeah? It's black shale. But this has a lot more silt, as you can see. In places, you even have phosphate class in here. Sometimes you have these mud laminae, so really black stuff, but also bioturbated. So these, these animals that you went through it and smeared the mud um, up and down. There's some conodons in here. Can I, so these white things is kind of hard to see, but conodons are easy to tell actually. Yeah? Conodons are, are pieces of your of jaws of, of small um, animals, yeah. And so when they fell apart, the, these these jaws also fell apart. So they have actually nice teeth, yeah, which is the reason why I can recognize them. Yeah? And they're made out of phosphate, which is nice for processing because you can dissolve the rest and get the phosphate behind. So that's that's actually great. So this type of fish is makes up about 90% of the upper buck and also a significant about, uh, amount of the low buck. And you have these two types of, of um, bioturbations in there. These guys here, which we had before, phenolitis and all kinds of vertical ones, which are these palophycus and certum. Yeah. Um, these ones here actually have much less TOC than the stuff surrounding them. So actually, whatever produced it was eating or taking in the TOC. And now we go to the pro, uh, to the Phycosiphon and certum. I will show the same. I, I should probably have put in some some different slides, but you can see these holes in here. Yeah. So these these things are actually filled, as you can see, because they're black. Yeah. They're filled with clay and organic matter. AOM states stands for amorphous organic matter. So forget the amorphous for now. So just organic matter. And now another try for me to show the ripples. Um, a little ha difficult on the projector, but follow. So this is the baseline here. Yeah. Follow this line. See that? I'm actually shaking too much, but um, overall, you can actually see the ripple sets. This one and the one below 
that's going towards the baseline. So you get get these these silt laminate that kind of follow the inclination of these ripples. The reason they are so low inclined is not only you have the weird angle at which you cut them, it's also because mud compacts at 80 to 90 percent. So even if they have 30 degree angles originally, you compact them, compact them, you compact them, and then you end up with very, very low inclinations. So, but that also means that in this type of phases, we don't have an anoxic environment because we have um, a bunch of animals that are still living. So the, as the, the um, interpretation is here, we have a bunch of bad load transport, yeah, which means ridges reflected in the ripples. We don't have an oxic environment because we have these pores and these pores that produce a hole. Yeah. Probably more disoxic, oxic I wouldn't necessarily say, but disoxic because we have a bunch of organisms that produce the holes, um, but we seem to have a very low variety of species. Yeah. How frequent was bad load versus suspension? Currently, I don't know. I would speculate that much of the silt actually came in through bad load, which means suspension was probably much rarer than we currently think. And then finally, this is actually easy to recognize. You either have a bunch of shells here or these weird phosphatic oid phosphate class, a large phosphate class like here, different types of conodonts. Here you can see all the white stuff's conodonts. Yeah? They make up, up entire laminae, several millimeter thick. Yeah? So this. And actually, you have erosional erosion into the underlying stuff. I think there's another. Yeah, so you can see the erosion of this lag into the underlying stuff. So this is something that was concentrated by by a flow at the base of something that eroded into the ground. So we're definitely dealing with something that is um, a bad load process. Again, probably relatively nice hospital living conditions. Bunch of different, yeah, planolitis B, also planolitis I A type. And boros and phycocyte. So, getting to the depositional model, overall, again, same concept. Yeah? Energy goes down the further we go down here. So, we have the highest energy with the erosional surfaces and the condodons always in the most proximal part. Yeah? The further we go down, we lose that. We have more silt in here. The more we go down, the less silt we get in here. We have mostly these radiolarian deposits. This kind of stuff characterizes every facies. But these type, yeah, these conodont lags characterize only the proximal facies, and radiolarians mostly characterize the distal facies. So again, probably low inclination overall. All the Wilson Basin have, um, units have this, or nearly all of them. Yeah, grain size decreases la, uh, decreases da, um, down ramp, yeah, or the further you go outwards. And much. The, the muds and ripples are actually mostly preserved here. And the main reason is here, you have too much reworking, too much bioturbation, so they get all bioturbated. You don't see them anymore. And here, the currents that produce them are so low energy that they probably won't produce the ripples necessarily anymore. There's another thing that's really weird. That is, look at the TOC content. And we did that at mostly um, cores that had the, the same maturity. So you go from something like 10.5% TOC in the proximal part to only 3.5% TOC in parts of the distal part. That's completely counterintuitive, right? Makes no sense at all. I, I would agree with that, actually. So let's let's see. You know that professors have a model for anything, yeah? whether it's true or not. Yeah? I'll tell you something about this. And um, no, I, I won't, won't tell you why that's not true, Will, but we can discuss it. Anyway, um, but in general, the thing is, is the following. In the upper Bakken, yeah, you, you would agree, or you would agree probably that the radiolarians occur anywhere, right? So why are they only preserved in the distal most part, or mostly preserved in the distal most part? And the main reason I will call for the same reasons again. So in the, in the more proximal part of the shale system, we still, and we've seen that erosion potential, so the preservation potential was not so good. But in the distal part, we don't have a lot of strong currents coming in, so that these things actually sink down to the ground and actually are embedded and are kept there. So they're pre it's a preservation, probably a preservation signal, at least in part, that it makes it that the radiolarians are more frequent here than they are here. And if you actually look closely, you will see that some of them occur also in the other parts. But it, it is probably at least, to a degree, a preservation potential. Another thing is, if you look at the radiolarian beds, yeah, they that occur especially here, they have very low TOC values. 
So something around 3.5 to 5.8 percent. And the reason is there is so much quartz in these things, yeah, there's no space for anything else. And so it's mostly, you have 100 percent, if you fill it up all with quartz from these radiolarites, you don't have a lot of um, room to accumulate a lot of TSC. This stuff here, there are not much, many radiolarites, has mostly clay, and the clay comes down with the organic matter and forms this marine snow. Have you seen that? Boring, boring movies from the deep sea. You put down a camera and wait for several hours. What do you see? You see all these things sinking down, yeah? Accumulations of clay, organic matter, all kinds of stuff. Yeah? It sinks down to the, to the ground and just stays there. Yeah? Kevin Boax would tell you that about 4% of the organic matter that goes down like this is preserved. Where does he have the number from? He doesn't know, I don't know, you don't know. Yeah? Why 4%? But there's a single digit, probably most likely single digit component of what gets preserved in the rock record. Yeah? So, now I'm so off topic, I don't even know um, what. But overall, the, the TOC gradient here has to do with the preservation yeah? and with the fact that the radiolarians are mostly preserved here. That means, though, that much of the stuff that's actually clay rich here, it accumulates in this environment, has similar TOC content as here. Is it too contradictory? I apologize. So, another thing you can see, and that goes a little bit into this anoxic environment. Thing. We have two burrow types in the very proximal environment and two types of fecal sphingo. The further we go down, the more we lose them. In the distal part, we have one type of fecal string and nearly no burrows left. And in some of these very pure radiolarians, we don't even have a single burrow type, which means you can see we interpreted that as the diversity of the organisms, organisms living in this environment was going down. And therefore, most likely, it became more dysoxic in this environment, while it was probably way more oxic here in the proximal part. My favorite. This is the thin section. So we're talking about, I can't do it in English, but um, what is it, two inches? Yeah. Um, I think it's something like one inch by two inches. So in centimeters, it would be 2.5 centimeters by five. So look at the TOC value. and. Um, the friend of mine who's now working with Hess, before was at the USGS, who was co-author on this paper, actually did all this work. So the, the point was the different facies were actually drilled separately. So we actually took a drill, or mostly him, him, he took a drill, and drilled this kind of stuff separately from this, from this, from this, and so on and so forth. Now, these are the TOC values that, that come out. So you can see that TOC goes from about 8% down to the middle here, to the pure radiolarites, to 3.4%, goes back down to nearly 8. Yeah. So we have a var var variation of just TSC, this is just TSC, yeah. in a single thin section that goes from 3.5 to more than the double. Yeah. So now, you see, what, what do all companies do? I can ask anybody who works with all companies. Yeah. They go in and take, at regular intervals, their their samples for geochemistry. What do you think will come out? Random. Right? So the, the thing to do, and that is what I'm working currently working with Noble Energy on, is you first do facious analysis yeah, in these things, then you come up and actually sample this stuff for geochemistry because the outcome is much better. Right? It's much more accurate, and you don't have these, these fiber curve zigzags that, essentially speaking, tell you something about the range of the QC in there, not necessarily about what the rock is doing. And then you can go a step further. Yeah? So these are the facious associations of this particular rock. So you can see facious association one encompasses all of these facious association two. As I said, JSR forced us to take 11 facious out because, probably rightfully so, they said that People would have forgotten phases as phases one while reading phases six or seven. But if you actually do that yeah, and force it upon the poor reader, yeah, then what you'll see is that your phases one has a much more narrow range of QC values. Your phases two, again, has a relatively narrow range, regardless where you go off these QC value, and your phases three yeah, would have, again, a different range of QC values. So actually what you get out much better represents the type of depositional setting and the process that went on in this specific environment. 
So if we do that, then you can actually see that phases one has a range of three and a half to nearly six a percent TLC phases two at about six and a half to nearly seven yeah? and see both are radiolarian deposits yeah? so it is actually much more useful and the phases associations don't represent the rock as well as individual phases would I always tell my student that is also true for the next slide don't put tables on the slide this is a table so I will just move on but if you do that actually this is what will come out uh, so very distinct ranges of TSC for very distinct phases I think these are 10 so I skipped one I don't know I think I finally yeah first JSR forced us to get rid of a phases and get rid of another five phases so that's what we did anyway a little bit about the phases architecture and then I'm, I'm done so what we did here is we looked for the more for the higher energy shales versus the lower energy shales, and that is what these triangles here are for. So lower energy versus higher energy. Yeah? And this is what we based our power sequences on. Yeah? So radiolarians are mostly distal, the higher energy condon silts on lags, shell debris are more proximal. So what I sold to whom did I sell to? To Hess Corporation and Marathon was to see how much of this would actually hold true, so actually trace these things out. Right? And from February 1st, I can tell you about the results before I'm not allowed to do to say anything. But there are power sequences in shales, right? and you can see then, this wouldn't be the first study to trace these things out, but it's nearly the first study. Another thing is, you know how companies are. Taking a core from 10,000 feet depth is actually a hassle. Yeah? You drill, then you take the core, you have to drag it up again then you have to go back down take a let another piece of the core and so on it's much easier to do it with wireline locks yeah? so how much how does this is this represented in wireline locks yeah? can we upscale it can we actually tell something from the thin section to something we can observe in core to something we can observe in wireline locks that is the important part that is what upscaling is about and that's what the company is interested in yeah? so this is what we're currently working on. We have nearly completed that, and unfortunately, I can't talk much about it. Just a few conclusions. That's always what you should say in talk, yeah? You can't talk about it, and so people won't ask you. Okay. Anyway, so Bakken is, as I hope, hopefully have shown you, not necessarily layer cake, especially the middle part. Yeah? The middle Bakken is compartmentalized into these three to six distinct coarsening or finding upward dunes so into these power sequences. You can actually trace them laterally um, through the basin that gives you a better idea what was deposited simultaneously. The shale facies, if you want to see something, use ultra thin thin section, otherwise you won't see anything. I would argue that most of the Bakken deposition was not happening in an anoxic environment, even though these things have QC percent of up to 10 and a half, which is a lot. So the question now is, why the heck do we have 10.5% TSC in something that was not deposited in an anoxic environment, which is an interesting question. You can talk about half an hour about that. If you want to risk that, please go for it. And you can see that the Bakken shales reflect sea level fluctuation. That's the reason why they actually are arranged in distinct power sequences. And I tried to show you, I had to put that on you, that facies the facial association as defined do not capture the geochemical complexities in the system. Distinct facies do that much better than facial associations do. This has to be, so I would like to thank these companies that actually sponsored the research, especially on the middle back end. Brigham currently already bought by Stadol for only $3.3 billion. Mm. Samsung in Denver and St. Mary land and exploration company at the time when I started the project it was still NANS and these people helped me tremendously Pat Matlock at the time was Brigham Exploration Ken Tompkins Samson Neil Fishman at the USGS now with Hess and these are my student Aaron Vandola who did the middle back and study and Ali Jaffrey who helped with the middle back and and finally Julie Lefebvre who was nice enough to give us the key to her core lab even over the weekends and let us measure incredibly many cores thank you so much to listening for me for an hour i'll take any questions sorry